It goes without saying that Ferrari have been having a bit of a hard time as of late. It has been 15 years since the longest running and most successful team in Formula 1 history have won the Constructors' Championship and 16 years since they have won the Drivers' Championship. In that time, they have remained consistently competitive and have won lots of races, but have only had brief periods of dominance and have never been able to sustain championship challenges against Red Bull and Mercedes, despite having had top-tier driver lineups for near on 30 years now. 2017 onwards has been especially sordid, as three times they have taken early leads in the standings only for their campaigns to collapse under them, partly due to reliability and driver error, but more often than not because of substandard race strategies. In 2023, things are really not looking good, as they are making all of the same strategy errors as in 2022, but the car is no longer anywhere near fast enough to challenge for race wins. Their target this year was first in the Constructors' Championship, and they're currently looking at fourth. As bad as things are, however, they could be so much worse. And indeed, they have been. Time to rewind the clock 50 years. The 1970s was a large period of innovation in Formula 1. Aerodynamics were still in their infancy, and the first major pushes for improved safety standards had begun. Ferrari were already the most experienced team in Formula 1, and the only one left to have been present since 1950, and since then had won six Drivers' Championships and two Constructors' Championships. Mauro Forghieri had been technical director since 1961, but the team had struggled and often fell behind teams such as Lotus, Brabham, McLaren and Tyrrell. In 1975, Ferrari launched the 312T, which stood out on the grid as almost every other team was running the 3-litre V8 Ford Cosworth DFV engine and a longitudinal Hewland gearbox, whereas the 312T had a 3-litre flat 12 Ferrari Tipo engine and a transverse gearbox of their own design. It also had a semi-monocoque chassis instead of the ubiquitous full monocoque chassis pioneered on the Lotus 25 in 1962, and this created a large amount of flexibility for modification. This unique drivetrain configuration meant the car had a very low centre of gravity and very neutral weight distribution, making it much more drivable than its predecessor, the 312B3-74, and in 1975 Niki Lauda and Clay Regazzoni won six races and comfortably gave the team their first drivers and constructors titles in 11 years. In 1976, the massively oversized overhead airboxes emblematic of 1975 were banned, and so the 312T2 featured a pair of NACA-type air ducts built into the side of the cockpit instead. Ferrari took their second consecutive constructors title in 1976, however, Lauda's near death at the German Grand Prix which meant he missed two races and then decided to voluntarily retire from the final round at Fuji due to deteriorating weather conditions meant he lost the driver's title to the McLaren of James Hunt by just one point. A B-spec model of the 312T2 was run in 1977, and here the team started demonstrating the car's versatility and adaptability by using circuit-specific wings at different races, something commonplace today. A six-wheeled version, dubbed the 312T6, was also tested that had four wheels on the rear axle, but this concept was abandoned as it was far beyond the permitted width in the regulations and Reutemann crashed it heavily in testing at Fiorano. Ferrari also teased the Tifosi with a cleverly doctored image of what appeared to be an eight-wheeled car dubbed the 312T8, but such a car was never built. This high degree of experimentation meant the car could sometimes be difficult to handle, but it did not stop Lauda taking his second title and the team taking their third consecutive constructors title. Lauda secured the driver's title with two rounds remaining, and then left the team as he did not get on with new teammate Carlos Reutemann, and his relationship with the team had deteriorated ever since he gave up the 1976 title at Fuji, and he was replaced of Gilles Villeneuve. The 312T2B was used for the first two rounds of 1978 before the launch of the 312T3. Internally, the car was virtually unchanged, but externally it was entirely different, with a brand new chassis and suspension designed to fit around their new Michelin radial tyres, a new technology in Formula 1, having run Goodyear since 1973. It also had a very low engine cover to improve airflow to the rear wing. The car was as good as all of its previous iterations, but Ferrari and every other team had been blindsided by Lotus, who in 1977 had launched the Type 78, the first Formula 1 car to use ground effect by way of a large pair of Venturi tunnels on each side of the chassis sealed to the ground by brushes, and in 1978 launched the Type 79, which followed this design but replaced the brushes with independently sprung skirts that could be raised and lowered as needed and created a near-perfect seal to the ground. 
As most of their downforce was now being generated under the car instead of above, it gave the massively increased cornering speed of minimal drag. In normal conditions, Ferrari could not touch them, and their only saving grace was Lotus's poor reliability, mostly caused by the stresses put on the car by the increased downforce. Reutemann managed to win three races and finished third in the standings, whereas Villeneuve's hyper-aggressive driving style was less well suited to the car's neutral handling characteristics, and he was also crash-prone and won his home race in Canada, but finished outside the points more times than in and was ninth in the standings, and Ferrari finished runners-up to Lotus in the constructors. In 1979, Ferrari and every other team realised the only way to remain competitive was to design ground effect cars of their own. Ferrari ran the 312T3 for the first two rounds, and then launched the 312T4 in South Africa, which was also the home race for Reutemann's replacement Jody Schechter. Attempts were made to narrow the chassis as much as possible to maximise space for the very large Venturi tunnels, complete with flexible side skirts, but this was inhibited by the very wide flat 12 engine and the fact that the now 4-year-old car had never been designed with ground effect in mind. Forgieri compensated for this by fitting what were still very large front and rear wings to regain the lost downforce. During the season, the team also tested a semi-automatic gearbox of Forgieri's design, which used a system of buttons on the steering wheel instead of hand-operated paddles behind it, as is now commonplace, but as Villeneuve preferred the original gearbox, it was abandoned and wouldn't be used in competition until 1989. Reutemann had moved to Lotus, but they had fallen behind their rivals as the even more radical Type 80 ended up not working as planned, so they were forced to revert to the already outdated Type 79. Williams and Ligier had by far the best aerodynamics on the grid, but Williams had endless reliability problems hampering their challenge, and Ligier had so much downforce that it was flexing the chassis and suspension, and Renault's pioneering turbocharged engine was the most powerful, but more often than not would go up in a cloud of white smoke. Ferrari's engine, while naturally aspirated, was itself very powerful and they also had near-perfect reliability and very durable tyres. The car's superiority was demonstrated by Villeneuve and Schechter taking a pair of 1-2 finishes in its first two races, which briefly gave Villeneuve the lead in the championship. He quickly lost this, however, as Schechter took a pair of wins of his own in Belgium and Monaco, but in Belgium Schechter had collided with Clay Regazzoni who was then hit by Villeneuve which tore off his front wing and meant he finished 7th. At Dijon Premois, Schechter struggled and finished 7th, and Renault came into their own as the long straights and sweeping corners perfectly suited the huge power advantage of their turbo engines. Jean-Pierre Jabouy won, but Villeneuve had a legendary battle for 2nd with his teammate René Arnoux and they went back and forth and banged wheels, but Villeneuve eventually came out on top. Ferrari suffered at the high-speed corners of Silverstone, and Schechter and Villeneuve qualified 11th and 13th, and Schechter managed to salvage 5th after running 3rd in the closing laps, but Villeneuve lost fuel pressure from 7th with 5 laps to go. In Austria, the two drivers went from 5th and 9th to 2nd and 4th respectively, though Villeneuve had a lightning-fast start and led the opening laps. At Zandvoort, Schechter dropped to last on the first lap but heroically drove to second, whereas Villeneuve suffered a tyre blower while running in second and did an entire lap in a lopsided car on two wheels before returning to the pits to be told the car was beyond repair. At Monza, the team's home race and their 300th race, Schechter and Villeneuve qualified third and fifth. Retirements for their rivals meant they ran in formation at the front, and Villeneuve chose to obey team orders to maintain position, despite the fact that this cost him the driver's title to Schechter, and Ferrari also took their fourth constructor's title in five years. Villeneuve finished second and first in the final two rounds which left him four points behind Schechter. Both drivers had won three races apiece. The Williams of Alan Jones had won four, but he had suffered seven mechanical retirements, two of which were from pole, whereas Schechter had a tyre blowout at Watkins Glen after he had secured the title, and Villeneuve's gearbox died at Monaco, he lost fuel pressure in the dying stages at Silverstone, had power drops in Germany which left him a lap down in eighth, and a tyre blowout of his own at Zandvoort. Consistency and reliability won the day for Schechter, who finished in the points in all but three races, something almost unheard of at the time. In 1980, Ferrari launched the 312T5, which cosmetically was very similar to the 312T4 but with revised aerodynamics to attempt to compensate for its limited ground effect. Attempts had been made to narrow the engine, and Schechter jokingly suggested flipping it up on its side. Villeneuve was widely seen as the favourite to win the title, but concerns were raised when he and Schechter qualified 8th and 11th respectively at the season opener in Argentina, and then Villeneuve crashed from 2nd and Schechter had an engine failure from 3rd. In Brazil, they qualified a more promising 3rd and 8th, though Villeneuve crashed twice in practice, but he took the lead at the start, though both drivers later retired of engine problems. 
In South Africa, they qualified 9th and 10th, but Schechter's gearbox died and Villeneuve had an engine failure, beginning the season with three double retirements. Villeneuve had another gearbox failure at Long Beach, but Schechter soldiered on and managed to finish a lap down in 6th to score a point. Villeneuve replicated this in Belgium while Schechter finished 8th, giving them their first double finish of the year, five races in. In Monaco, Villeneuve qualified 6th but Schechter was way down in 17th and Villeneuve managed to finish 5th to score two more points but Schechter retired with handling problems. At Paul Ricard, they qualified a dismal 17th and 19th and finished 8th and 12th and by this point Schechter had privately made the decision to retire at the end of the year. Brands Hatch was even worse as they qualified 19th and 23rd and Villeneuve had an engine failure and Schechter finished 3 laps down in 10th. Wieler finished 6th from 16th in Germany to score another point while Schechter went from 21st to 13th. They finished 8th and 13th in Austria and then 7th and 9th at Zandvoort. At their home race at Imola, Villeneuve debuted their turbocharged 1981 car, the 126C in practice, but used the 312T5 in the race, and Schechter had a heavy crash at turn 2 in practice and then made his retirement decision public. Villeneuve crashed at the same place in the race, and the corner now bears his name, and Schechter finished 8th. In a cold Canada, Villeneuve qualified 22nd, but Schechter was 26th and failed to qualify for the first time in his Formula 1 career. Villeneuve did better in the race and finished 5th out of 11 finishers, and on the lead lap. At the season finale at Watkins Glen, where Schechter had made his Formula 1 debut 8 years earlier, Villeneuve qualified 18th and crashed out, and Schechter qualified 23rd and finished 3 laps down in 11th. Schechter, Villeneuve and Ferrari had gone from being defending driver's champion, defending vice driver's champion and defending constructor's champion to finishing 19th and 14th respectively in the driver's championship and 10th in the constructor's championship. Improvements had been made to the car's aerodynamics, but they were still limited by the comparative lack of ground effects, and they mainly found serious problems getting the Michelin radial tyres to work properly, which were far better suited to the turbocharged Renault. Reliability was passable, but still far worse than in 1979. Villeneuve clearly handled the car much better than Schechter, outqualifying him all but once and scoring 6 points to Schechter's 2. Schechter's failure to qualify in Canada was the first time a Ferrari driver had failed to qualify since Mario Andretti at the Monaco Grand Prix in 1971, and only the third time in Formula 1 history, having never happened to a Ferrari driver since. Schechter finishing 19th in the Drivers' Championship and Ferrari 10th in the Constructors' Championship remains the worst title defence by a driver and constructor in Formula 1 history. 10th place is also their worst Constructors' result in their history, and the 8 points they scored is only one more than the 7 scored in 1969, when they finished 6th in the standings. In 1981, the 312T, which despite the 1980 season holds the honour of being the most successful Formula 1 car in history, was finally put to rest after six seasons and Ferrari launched the aforementioned 126C, which now had full ground effects like their rivals and had the flat 12 engine replaced of a turbocharged V6. This car's own handling problems, caused mostly by the aerodynamics still not being very polished, were compensated for by it now having the most powerful engine on the grid and being untouchable in a straight line, and they were once again competitive. Villeneuve stayed on with the team until his untimely death at the Belgian Grand Prix in 1982, and with his retirement Jody Schechter was replaced with Didier Peroni and then went into business and now runs a biodynamic farm in Hampshire in southern England. He has purchased almost every car he raced with, including his championship winning 312T4, and despite their resurgent competitiveness following his retirement, he remained Ferrari's last driver's champion for 21 years, but did later say that the champion's reunion at the Bahrain Grand Prix in 2010 is the only time since his retirement that he has felt genuine recognition as a Formula 1 champion. Since 1980, Ferrari have won 6 driver's championships and 10 constructor's championships, Seven races into 2023, they are fourth in the constructors' standings with a single podium, which is their worst start to a season since 2014. The car is perfectly good in qualifying, as are the drivers, but once it stops eating tyres in races then they can ease up a bit with the pit strategies. The Ferrari Formula 1 outfit may be a shambles, but as demonstrated by their recent win at Le Mans, if Leclerc wants his hand on any more booty, maybe he should give endurance racing a go. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Brook underscore F1. A huge shout out and thank you as ever to my Patreon subscribers. Do subscribe to my Patreon if you want early access to audio only versions of each video, as well as a few videos that YouTube won't allow me to put up. And I'll see you all next time.